Thank you. Look, I'm delighted to formally introduce Professor Chris Sara. He's a professor of education at the University of Canberra, and he became the first Aboriginal principal of the Sherberg School in Queensland in the late 1990s. And at that school, he made very significant changes to how Indigenous students experienced education and achieved remarkable outcomes with those, those young people. Chris grew up in Bundaberg, the youngest of 10 children, and he faced similar challenges to those his students faced in Cherbourg. The strengths-based approach that he developed there led to the formation of the Stronger, Smarter Institute, which he now chairs. That institute works with schools and communities all around Australia. Professor Sara also chairs the Prime Minister's Indigenous Advisory Council. His qualifications include a PhD in psychology from Murdoch University and his thesis, Strong and Smart, toward a Towards a Pedagogy for Emancipation, Education for First Peop Peoples, has been developed into a book and published in 2011. Please welcome Professor Chris Sara. Thank you, Connie. Let me start as I should by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet. Um, so delighted to be to be here. I am um, a little bit nervous tonight, I've got to say, um, in part because it's such a flash audience, <laughs> and um, it's quite a big audience too. I wasn't expecting it to be so big. Um, but also in part because my son is here tonight. And uh, it's... When I was thinking earlier of, of things to be grateful for in the day, I was just reflecting on how good it is to hang out with my son and spend time. I brought him along because he doesn't really know what I do through when I'm away. <laughs> so I thought maybe I can usually just come and uh, just watch. And so. He's a little bit of a hard marker. We went to, um, where did we go? We went to the musical Aladdin. And uh, he, we, it was magnificent. Anybody see it? It was quite magnificent, wasn't it? Well, he, he liked it, but he said, the genie wasn't as good as Robin Williams. So <laughs> what, nobody's as good as Robin Williams, so. Um, I'm a little bit nervous because of that, but I'm sure we'll get there. I, um, I know the, the, this oration has been delivered since 1981 in honour of former Brotherhood Executive Director Jeffrey Sandville, uh, and designed to reflect, as we heard earlier, uh, that very strong interest in social justice um, <clears throat> and, uh, and achieving a, a better, much richer society in which all of us are included and none of us are left at the margins. Uh, and it's very much in line with the sort of work that I've been involved in. I, um, can I acknowledge you tonight, Connie, and thank you for having me here. I, as I understand, this is your first big night tonight, and what a night it is, hey? It's, uh, it's quite magnificent. Uh, and again, as I say, delighted to be here. Tonight on investing in, on the notion of um, investing in indigenous children, I, I want to um, gently, and respectfully challenge and stretch your minds uh, and ask you to think about how we invest in Indigenous children and Indigenous communities and whether that investment creates value or diminishes value for those children and those, those communities. I, um, I think what I'll do is refer to the slides um, that you can see there because I want to give you a sense of where I've come from in order to understand this kind of stronger, smarter approach and the things that underpin its, its success. So if I show you, um, this is my country. I, my, my grandfather's country is uh, Tarabalang, Bunda, and it's uh, the area in and around Bundaberg, and my grandmother's country is just north of there, Gurang Gurang. And, um, you can see where, where that is. Uh, and that's, that, 
gorgeous looking river there, possibly the best river in all of Australia, uh, is the Burnett River, runs through my country. And so it's pretty sp special and I feel strengthened by being able to say that that's, that's where I come from, that's where my ancestors have come from. And then as we look closer, you'll see some iconic things about Bundaberg there. And you'll see that river, I'm not sure if I can, no, it's not, you'll see that river there and uh, you'll see, in fact I wonder is it possible to get it up on this middle slide, middle, and you don't need to see my face too, that big I suppose. Hey, what do you reckon? No, it's okay. So, so you can see that you can see the Burnett River there flowing through, and my house is not far from there. And you can see some of those iconic figures from Bundaberg. Uh, you see the sugar there, Bundaberg sugar. We've all seen that, right? Oh, it's quite delicious. Well, my school is kind of in that picture, and my house is in that picture because the house that I grew up in is immediately across the road from the Milliquin Sugar Mill. And so we would walk through the Milliquin Sugar Mill on our way to school and on our way home. And sometimes if we're bored, I can't quite point it out to you, but uh, there are some big sheds, as big as this room and bigger, where they would just plonk the sugar on the ground. And uh, it was like sand dunes. And so we would run up these sand dunes. So you can imagine these little black kids running up and down and rolling down with sugar in our hair. And in our ears, and then they package it up like that and they'll send it out. <laughs> so that's Bundaberg. You can see the you can see the Bundaberg rum bottle. Many of you will know that, right? Um, one of my claims to fame is if you look at the back of the bottle, it says Whitred Street, and I always feel proud of that, no matter where you go in the world, because Whitred Street was my street, and so it's on there. Me and Bundaberg Rum, we don't talk anymore. Um, we went out when I was at home from Teachers College and uh, went out one night together and nearly turned me inside out, so we just don't talk anymore. Um, yeah. And Bundaberg Rum is made just up the road from my place as well. So for a lot of those houses in that area, there's a, a pipe that comes underneath and then up into the house. So everyone gets there. No, that, that's not true. That's not true. <clears throat> so that's Bundaberg, some of the figures. This is my family. Uh, you can see that we're a pretty ragtag mob. I'm the youngest of ten. Uh, it's very hard being the youngest of ten. Um, that's my father there. You can see him looking um, very Italian, doesn't he? Uh, that's because he, my father was born in a village called Milianico in the province of Abruzzo. Um, he had a wife and three kids in Italy. And uh, he came out to Australia, he met my mum. And for whatever reason, he didn't go back to Italy. And that, that relationship broke down, and so he got with my mum and had 10 children out here. He's very fertile, my father. Um, <laughs> and he was... He was a very good man, you know, the six boys in my family. And what I learnt from my father was the value of working hard. And so in and around Bundaberg, there are lots of small crops. Um, so my childhood, I remember very well growing up, uh, going out into um, share farms where my father had partnerships with his other Italian mates. And we would work picking tomatoes or pumpkins or zucchinis or cucumbers, eggplant. Bird's eye chilies, you never want to get a job picking bird's eye chilies. And in the summertime we picked tobacco. There's not much tobacco in Bundaberg anymore, but we picked tobacco. Uh, and when I look back, I thought, it was kind of a neat way to make the transition from boyhood into manhood for us, because I remember being out in the tobacco fields as early as seven or eight years old, and we'd pick a little bit and then we'd go and sit on the tractor, and then we'd, um, by the time we were 12, 13, we'd picking, picking our own row. Uh, but we weren't getting paid the same as the men. But by the time we were 14, 15, we were picking, doing the same work as the men. And when the boss hands over that check and you're getting $8 an hour, the same as what the men are getting, you feel like a man. Uh, and it was a good feeling. It was a nice way to make that transition from boyhood into manhood. 
Um, I learnt, I've, I've never seen any, anyone work as hard as my father. Um, and I learnt from him, you know, if, if, if I don't pick my row, um, then somebody else has got to come and pick my row. And in, in that circumstance where there was a bunch of guys around, if somebody else is having to pick my row all the time, then that's a circumstance that lacks integrity. And so I take those lessons into life and uh, make sure that I pick my row. And if I see other people struggling, I'll go and help them pick their row as well. Some good lessons. From my mum, um, I, I learned a lot of things as well. It was a nice combination. You see that house up there? On, uh, on the other side of the house, that's the Millicorn Mill. You can see that chimney is the Millicorn Mill chimney from the factory. That chimney's not in our house. Um, <coughs> But uh, in that house, there were, th there were my oldest sister had gone off by the time I was born, and she, there were the three big boys in one room, the three little boys in another room, and uh, the three girls in another, and my mum and dad in another room. So we're all packed into this house, and life was good um, in the house. Over, over on the right-hand side of the house, we had an old guy who lived there with his wife, and we kind of grew up with him talking not very nicely to us, you know, calling us little black bastards and all of that sort of thing. And um, in spite of that, we'd still go and mow his grass for him and this kind of thing. And over the back of our house was another guy who would swerve his car at us when we were playing football in the front yard or, or um, I used to call my mum an old black gin, um, which was never very pleasant to have to live in those circumstances. And I don't... I'm not sharing this story with you to make you feel sorry for me or anything like that. I'm just, I'm just saying, exp describing what life was like for us. This was the 1970s in Bundaberg. Joby Albert Peterson, remember that name? My goodness gracious me. He was the premier at the time, and it was just okay for people to speak in that kind of way, you know. And so we had to, we had to deal with it. And so my mum taught us how to deal with that, you know, um, with messages with messages so pure that I use them with my own kids today. Um, talk to us about, you know, when you would go home to mum and say, oh, they're calling us a black bull at school or black nigger or this kind of thing. My mum would look us, put us down and look us in the eye and she'd say, yes, you are black and you don't let anybody put you down because of that. You're no better, no worse than anybody else. Um, and she got me to understand that being Aboriginal was precious, it was special. Um, it didn't mean that we were second-rate citizens. And so when we talked about that, and I talked to my own kids in this way, when they encounter the same sorts of racism, we talk about why somebody would say that, um, and we get to understand that the reason they would say that is because maybe they see you up here, and the only way that they think they can pull you down here is by referring to the colour of your skin or the fact that you're Aboriginal. And as I say to them, you, you, you and me know that being Aboriginal is precious, it's special. Um, and so when we understand it in that context, um, then we can have a conversation about why that person is feeling down there and trying to pull us down in the first place and what we do about that to help them lift themselves up rather than try to pull us down. So very pure messages uh, I learned from my mum. I can't explain to you why my mum was so powerful in that regard. Um, because she was the youngest of five and I watched her brothers succumb to the challenges of racism in and around that time. And so in our household, uh, in our family and in our extended family, we, we certainly watched things like domestic violence, alcoholism, but never in our house. Um, and so I remember my uncles would come to our place to sober up or dry out, but they would never disrespect our house, I think because they respected my mum so much and respected my father so much. So there was kind of like this force field around our house um, in which things were positive. So that's, that's a little bit about where I've come, where I've come from. Um, I, that's me on the first day of school. See a handsome, strapping young, not as handsome as Glenn Brennan, but um, that's my two big sisters. My brother is in that photo, well he's not in that photo there, but he, he and I started grade one together, and so he was in that photo. Um, 
me and my brother have got issues at the moment, so I just cut him out of the photo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's another story. Um, I finished high school in 1984. I don't, anybody else finish in 1984? Yeah, remember those days? 99 red balloons, bust them loose, all that. Um, and when I finished high school, I, um, I remember very well uh, talking to other people about, um, other, other, other kids were talking about this thing called QTAC. And I, I thought, what is QTAC? And so QTAC, as I discovered, because I went to see the guidance counsellor, QTAC means the Queensland, meant the Q Queensland Tertiary Admissions Centre form. So you fill this form in if you want to go to university. So I go and see the guidance counsellor. I said, what's it all about? He says, you fill in the forms and you're away. He says, you've got enough board subjects. Didn't have a clue what he was talking about. He said, so we should fill in a form for you. <clears throat> so he says, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. I said, what do you think will be the best career? I said, I don't know, that's what I came to see you about. <laughs> and uh, Anyway, I liked phys ed. I was good at phys ed. Um, I was good at English as well. I used to love writing, still do. And uh, I said, phys ed teacher? He said, all right, we'll put that, we'll put that down as your first preference. Uh, he says, you won't get into that because the score will be too high. And um, then we put down all these other courses and where they were courses at Gatton Agricultural College. I think there was a social work one in there, somewhere like that. And then I walked out of his office thinking, what the hell was that all about? Um, but anyway, there was something serendipitous about that because school had finished, I went to the prom. It's getting flashbacks now. Um, I don't know why. It, no, I didn't go there. Um, <laughs> went out picking tobacco, not sure about what the future held after school. And then uh, I got this letter that came in the mail and it had a number in it and the number was 750. It was my TE score, or ATAR we call it these days, 750. And 750 was like smack bang in the middle, was average. And because uh, I thought that's all you had to do at school, was just pass your tests and that was it. Boy, was I wrong. But anyway, um, didn't think much of it went by, another couple of days went by. And then I got this other envelope in the mail that was from the Brisbane College of Advanced Education. Um, and they said, look, we know that you haven't got the right TE score. Uh, we also know that you're interested in studying phys ed and we're running a program where we're going to get more Aboriginal secondary teachers uh, into schools. So I said, all right. They said, come down, have an interview, and we'll see what you got. Uh, so I thought, okay, have a look. So I go down, I had an interview, I wrote an essay, I had an interview, I must have did pretty well, um, because they wanted to give me a shot. They said, we think you can do this. And the entry score for Phys Ed the year before was 910. So here's me with this score of 750. And I'm looking at this score, and I'm looking at that score, and I thought, yeah, no, I, nah, I don't think I can do that. Um, and they said, don't worry about the score. That's just the way we sort people out. Um, and anyway, it's a three-year course. So th this was a, um, it was a three-year diploma you could start teaching um, in those days. This is back before the war. Um, <laughs> so this was back before the war, Iraq war, by the way. Um, <laughs> They said, we can spread your course out over four years and we'll just start you off on a lighter workload. And um, you will just, you know, you'll start off on a 60% workload and as you get the feel for it, we'll just build you up. So I said, all right, if that's the case, then I could probably do that. So I did the first semester, 60% uh, workload. Uh, and then I met that old looking guy in the corner there, Gary, Dr. Gary McLennan. Uh, he's quite a fierce, feisty Irishman, mad lefty, uh, feisty Irishman, and uh, used to swear a lot in his lectures. Um, and he got me by the intellectual scruff of the neck and he got me to see the world differently. And we had wonderful, rich conversations about that, things like the hidden curriculum and stuff like that. And uh, 
you know, I talked about my mum and my dad kindling a fire in my belly. Well, Gary came along and threw petrol on it. And um, he said, don't talk to your parents, talk to your folks about their education, talk to your older brothers and sisters, um, since you think your education was so good. So I did. I talked to my mum and she says, um, she said, I would have loved to be an archaeologist. She said, I would love to be an archaeologist, but we were only allowed to go to school until grade three. Um, and I said, how come you didn't go past grade three? And she said, oh, well, we weren't allowed to. Uh, they just thought of us as uncivilised and just didn't think that we could be educated. Um, so I said, all right. I go back and I talk to Gary about this. And he said, well, if she hasn't finished primary school and hasn't been into high school, how, how do you think she can support you as well as other parents who have been successful in primary school and high school. Um, don't you reckon that's going to have an effect? And I said, yeah, maybe, you know, probably. So I talked to my older brothers and sisters, one of whom you saw there, Tracy, and she says, oh yeah, I remember this teacher when we were in grade two, and she said, I'm going to, tomorrow, I'm going to bring a big bathtub and I'll wash these Aboriginal kids because they stink. And... Uh, you sit and you think about that and you think, man, how the hell do you make sense of that, you know? How do you, how do you, um, how do you trust a teacher um, who's the person you're supposed to trust and believe in, who's supposed to bring you hope but brings you things like that? Um, and then you grow up and you have your own children and we're told and we're getting smashed around the head and threatened to have welfare payments cut if we don't value education. And you think, well, how the hell are you supposed to value education if that's how you remember it or if it's treated you in that kind of a way? Um, and so all of these sorts of things started to make sense. And so in my first year, having reflected on that, I did pretty well. I did a 60% workload. I bumped it up in second semester. And I started to catch on to this sort of toxic stench of expectations. And uh, I thought, you know what, I've got, I think I've got this figured out. And even though I've missed out on some work back there, I want to finish this course in the same time as everybody else. Um, and Gary was saying to me, no, don't do it. You should just build an academic career. I said, no, I want to finish this in the same way as everybody else. And so what that meant was for the last two years, I was going to have to work 110, 120% workload to catch up on the work that I hadn't done previously. Does that make sense? And so that's what I did. I worked hard, I worked really hard at college because I was determined to finish. Um, in part, that's why I didn't have that illustrious rugby league career. <laughs> that's why you never saw me play State of Origin or anything like that. So I'm talking about the real football there, you're probably not sure what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just teasing, I'm teasing. Um, yeah, so I worked really hard in the last two years and I passed everything um, and passed very well, by the way. And um, you would think that I'd be happy to be finished teacher's college and be successful. Um, but you know what? The truth is I was actually more angry um, than when I realised in first year. Because I was thinking, what the hell is going on here? I've been working 110, 120% workload. I was told that I was this smart and I've outperformed kids who were supposedly this smart because for whatever reason, some of those kids fell by the wayside. But I didn't. So it turns out I was smarter than I was led, led to believe. And I realised that I'd been selling myself short in school because I kind of ran to a script that could have told me to only believe that this was good enough for me. I realised I'd been sold short by teachers who probably saw me as good to have there for the rugby league team and to win the Open Grand Final, but uh, not really, nobody ever kind of led me to believe that I would be a professor of education or a principal of a school or anything like that, certainly not talking in a flash venue like this. Um, so I was angry and uh, I think that very personal experience kind of fueled a sense of rage inside me and made me determined to want to change expectations of uh, Aboriginal kids right across Australia. So that's what I set about doing um, in my career as an educator. Uh, I was 20 when I started teaching, um, so that's what I did. 
that's Kelvin Grove College up there. That picture in the middle, that's me waiting for a girlfriend at college. <laughs> I'm kidding. The other one is the, the other one's the Norman B Hotel where we'd go and celebrate the end of term or end of year. I, I fell in love at the Norman B Hotel quite a few times actually. So, um, yeah. Anyway, we should move on. Um, and I had, a, I had a good career as an educator, you know, I ended up as the principal of, of Sherwood State School. Uh, and I went with that saying, you know, I, and I, at the time when I was working at the school, we had a young family, uh, I was writing my PhD in psychology, uh, I went with a very strong interest in this toxic effect of expectations, and um, I went knowing, you know, I inherited a school that was in chaos. Um, but it was a school that was colluding with a kind of stench of low expectations. And I knew that if I could alter those expectations, um, then I could transcend those as an individual. And if I knew I was leading a school and I could get expectations to change in that school, then we could transcend that. Uh, and transcend that we did. Um, to the, the children at the school, this is the very first thing I said to them. I said, the most important thing that you'll learn from me is that you can be Aboriginal and you can be successful. And if you're prepared to believe that, then I'm prepared to work with you. And if you play up and be the negative stereotype, then I will challenge you. Uh, if you are strong and smart in the way that we talk about, then you'll be rewarded for that. Uh, I did say to the teachers, what I believe is that our children can leave this school um, with a very strong um, positive sense of being Aboriginal and that they can leave uh, with academic outcomes that are comparable to any student in Queensland. And I did say to them, if you don't believe that, then you shouldn't be here. Um, there was a bit of a gasp when I said that. And I, and I should make clear that I didn't say, people, when you see this story on the TV or something like that, it looks great in drama. It sounds like I went in on the first day and said that. Well, that actually didn't happen. I said this about six or eight months in when I had, a, had time to have a look around and see what was good about the place and what was kind of in line with what I had believed given my own very personal kind of experiences. Um, and to the Aboriginal teacher aides, um, I wanted them to be embraced as co-educators. Um, so these are some of the results we got, pretty impressive. Um, so when I talk about education these days, I'm not like a, a lawyer who's read about education or a, a banker who um, gets romantic about it. I'm an educator who's done stuff. Um, so it's based on, the, when we talk about the stronger, smarter philosophical approach, it's based on some pretty high order intellectual theory that I was using when I was writing my PhD but it's also based on, on practice and things that I've done. So we did take school attendance from 62 to 94%. We didn't touch anybody's welfare payments to make that happen. We just made a school that children would want to turn up to uh, and that parents felt connected to and where parents felt like uh, we, were, we both had skin in the game and we were growing the kind of children that they wanted for their families. Uh, after, after I, I was at school, I was at the school for about seven, six and a half years, uh, and I left in part because I was a little bit tired, um, but also in part because we had found some success, and it made sense that we should package up what we learned and spread that to other schools around the country. And so, the Stronger Smarter Institute has has um, has worked with more than 3,000 school and community leaders in more than 800 schools with a reach of more than 51,000 Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander students. And you know something, one of the coolest things about the work that we've done over the, the last couple of years is that the, the sorts of things that we talk about and with the philosophical approach that we talk about, we can pretty much guarantee success. That's pretty cool. Uh, but what's also cool is that what we do works really well for poor white kids as well. Uh, and it bothers me as an educator um, that they are just as infected by this toxic stench of low expectations. So when we talk about this stronger, smarter philosophy, this is what we say. It's a philosophy that honours a positive sense of cultural identity, acknowledges and embraces uh, positive community leadership, 
<coughs> enabling innovative and dynamic approaches and processes that are anchored by high expectations relationships. And when we talk about high expectations relationships, we say that they are those um, which honour the humanity of others and in so doing acknowledge one's strengths, capacity and human right to emancipatory opportunity. I want to just drill down on a couple of those things. I'm going way off script here, but that's okay. Um, I want to just dr drill down on a couple of the key kind of components of that stronger, smarter approach and we'll um, talk this through. So when we talk about a positive sense of identity, uh, it was very clear from my work and my personal experiences that there is the presence of this very negative kind of stereotype that exists in Australia of Aboriginal people and of Aboriginal students. And in fact, I used my PhD research to quantify the existence of this stereotype in an empirical sense. So when we look at things like um, teaching of Aboriginal children, it's, it's hard work, but at one level it's as simple as this. You either, your actions and beliefs and, be, and behaviours as a teacher are either designed to nurture a stronger, smarter student identity, as I would say, or they're designed to collude with that negative stereotype. So let me explain what I mean. If that's the stereotype, <coughs> If we just accept, if I'm a teacher and I just accept that Aboriginal kids are, um, turn up with a snotty nose and I don't tell them to go and blow their nose or something like that. I just wanted to see how you did that. <laughs> turn up with a snotty nose. Um, if, I, if I'm a teacher and I don't do anything about it and I just say, oh, that's just Aboriginal kids, they're like that. Well, I'm actually, I'm actually in a circumstance where I'm colluding with that perception or that notion of poor health, Aboriginal kids having poor health. If I'm a teacher and I say, hey, this is a strong and smart classroom, we don't have snotty noses in our classroom, get some, get some tissues and blow your nose. Uh, if, I'm a, if I'm a school principal and I let an Aboriginal student tell me to get effed and throw chairs all around the room, um, and I just say, oh no, that's just, that's just Aboriginal kids, they've got complex lives. And, it's, that's how they behave. Well, then I'm I'm colluding with that that negative perception of them being aggressive or violent or whatever. I'm enabling that to be true, when in fact I'm paid to be in a relationship to nurture something other than that to smash that stereotype. Does that make sense? Um, if I'm a if I'm a principal, a school principal, and I if I just believe, oh, well, Aboriginal kids and Aboriginal families, they don't come to school every day. If I haven't got the courage to go out and have a conversation with those parents and say, you know, it's actually against the law to not bring your kids, send your kids to school, and, you know, is there something, is there a reason, let me understand why they're not coming to school, so that we can work on that together, um, because we want your kids to be stronger and smarter. If I just say, oh, no, it's, the parents don't send their kids to school, and that's just how it is here, well, I'm actually colluding with that perception of um, Aboriginal kids and families as being uh, chronically truant or disengaged from school. And I'm paid to be in that relationship. Does that make sense? I want to um, spend some time just drilling down on, um, into this conversation about uh, identity in a broader sense uh, and just get you to think about some some things and what we mean by that because it, I watch with some dismay where we go in Aboriginal policy and where we've gone over the last 15 years and I think it's worth making some time to try to understand this, this notion because it certainly applied to what we did at Sherberg and I think it can apply going forwards. And it's based on the, the work of a, a very dear friend of mine, Professor Roy Baskar, who's passed away now, but he was the founder of a critical realist movement. And in framing up this part of the conversation, I, I reflect on uh, the time when I left Sherbrooke School and I, we moved to Caboolture and uh, I um, was looking for a school for my own kids and I was talking to one principal. I said, so how would my kids go in your school, being Aboriginal and all? Because I wanted to see where he was at on this. He says, yeah, no problem. And I thought, Mm, I know it's not a problem, but I'm sensing there, there might be one. Um, he said, we're all Australian in here. Uh, he said, we, we, we don't worry about that stuff. Um, they can leave that at home. We, in here, we're all the same. We're all Australian. So straight away, straight away I knew there was a problem. Um, 
because it's problematic, you know, we can't, in our, and I get why, this guy, I wouldn't say he was racist, I, I just, I just think he was in a very important leadership position and he didn't understand this issue to the depth that he should have. It's not his fault. And I think as a nation, we don't understand this issue to the depth that we should because we're, we're driven by this need to, we think we need to fix Aborigines by making them the same as mainstream Australians. And so we, we have this kind of problem where we, we say, we'll close the gap. Well, the problem with that close the gap kind of mantra is it kind of suggests that us as blackfellas, we can only be as good as the average white Australian. Um, when we were so much more than that, in fact, many of us are well beyond that. And so that kind of rhetoric is a little bit problematic. And then we say, you know, people understand very well when they say, we want a hand up, not a hand out. And when you hear that, you think, yeah, I like that. You know, that makes sense to us, doesn't it? Um, but it actually casts the relationship in which somebody's up here and somebody's down here. Uh, and it's why I'm thankful that I've been able to persuade the Prime Minister to pick up on the rhetoric of doing things with people, not to people. Because when we talk about doing things with people, not to people, the relationship starts here. One is not superior to the other. Um, and that's a much more honourable place from which to start the relationship. And if we can start it from that point, then we have a greater tr chance of transcending the challenges we face together. Let me explain some of this. I know it's deep, so stay with me. Um, Roy Vesca talked about the notion of our entire identity in which we can be other and we can be the same. And that's okay. And so if we accept this proposition, then you don't have to force me to be a mainstream Australian. Um, because there are times when I can be just as mainstream Australian as you, and there are other times when I'll be Aboriginal. And you know what? That's okay. You shouldn't feel threatened by that. Um, <clears throat> because with uh, the, this concept called the universe, concrete universal, Professor Basca would talk about um, in its entirety there's all of us at our core are human and there are certain mediations upon our core humanity that, and all of that makes up our existence and those mediations will resonate differently according to place and time and context. Let me explain. So earlier you saw pictures of my father, right? Uh, from, a, uh, from the village of Milianico. And you saw my mother and you saw my country and all of that. So you would say to me, well, what are you? Are you Italian or are you Aboriginal or are you Australian or what? And I get why you would ask that question. Um, it's like this. Those notions of being Italian and being Aboriginal, being Australian, are mediations upon my core humanity. So at my core, I'm human. And at that level, you and I are the same. We can be same. Um, but when we consider those mediations and when they're, how they're influenced, um, differences appear. Magnificent differences appear. And so when I'm in my father's village of Emilianico, uh, and I'm speaking Italian to my half-brother, Giulio, um, and we're standing at the graves of my grandparents, my nonno and my nonna. Um, in that moment, because of where I am and what I'm doing, my sense of being Italian is resonating very strongly. And so in that moment, I feel very Italian, and I'm tremendously proud of that. I haven't relinquished or surrendered my sense of being Aboriginal. It's just not resonating as strongly at that particular time. Does that make sense? When I'm at home and I'm in that gorgeous Burnett River and I've got my fishing line in, I look across, I see Paddy's Island and I know that within the last 200 years some of my ancestors were slaughtered across there um, and I wonder what it's like and I sit and I think and I fish in that river and I think, man, my people have been fishing in this river for over more than a thousand years. That's cool. Um, my sense of being Aboriginal resonates strongly. Uh, when I stand here tonight and I talk to you about Aboriginal education, it makes my sense of being Aboriginal resonate more strongly. When I talk to the Prime Minister about how we make a difference, uh, my sense of being Aboriginal resonates strongly. Uh, and it will resonate strongly um, 
in a positive sense and in a negative sense, you know. So when I'm getting called a little black bastard by the old guy next door, that makes my sense of being Aboriginal resonate strongly. When I see children getting squeezed out of school or Aboriginal parents getting whacked around the head for not valuing school uh, or being told, you must value school, in spite of your, your memory or your histories, that makes me want to lean into my sense of being Aboriginal and stand up for a sense of justice for my people. I haven't surrendered my sense of being Italian, just not resonating as strongly. Make sense? And so most of my life, my sense of being Aboriginal resonates most strongly most of the time. There might be times when my sense of being Australian resonates, but not a lot, I've got to say. Um, so it's worth pondering the question. You know, when, we, when I look at the Australian flag and I see the Union Jack up there, do you think that would make my sense of being Australian resonate strongly? Um, or would that kind of convince me that I'm at the margins of this place and that would cause me to lean into my sense of being Aboriginal more? Um, when I hear the national anthem and the lyrics in there that talk about Advan Advance Australia Fair, does that give me enough to lean into my sense of being Australian or does it make me feel more marginalised and lean into my sense of being Aboriginal? You know, if we change the lyrics to embrace the notion of ancient culture or something like that, that might cause me to lean into my sense of being Australian and stand alongside. When Malcolm Turnbull says everybody's united on January 26th and so that should be Australia Day, I see tens of thousands of people in the street saying, no. Nah. And that crowd is getting bigger and bigger. And so when I see that, I, I think those things make me lean into my sense of being Aboriginal more strongly. And you know something, the truth is this from me, I can't speak for other blackfellas, but I would really love a day where I could lean into my sense of being Australian and be alongside people and sing a national anthem that I feel included in, or have a day of uh, celebration. I've said to the Prime Minister, think about the last Monday in January, um, because that would be an interesting compromise. It's at a nice time of the year. Um, it's a time when we've had holidays, we're reflecting on the year going forward. Um, it's not on January 26th, so it, it, would, it doesn't connect me to Governor Philip. Um, but it get, lets me stand alongside other Australians and other new Australians who've come, like my father. Um, that's something that would let me lean into my sense of being Australian and celebrate, celebrate that. Um, and you know what, for all the crazy nut jobs who want to cling to January 26, it would still fall on January 26 sometimes, you know? <laughs> um, so there's a compromise in there for you. So that's the conversation I wanted to have with you about this, um, this stratified ont ontology. I think it's a really interesting thing, and if we can, if we can understand that, that our total sense of identity is our core humanity, um, and these mediations upon our um, core humanity, then you don't have to be in a thing where you think you have to smash the blackness out of me to make me be mainstream Australian, to feel like you've got, got the challenge sorted. Um, we can embrace a policy context in which we nurture and enrich our sense of being Aboriginal. And we can stop this nonsense where we say culture is a problem and start to understand that actually culture is profoundly and fundamentally not the problem, it's profoundly and fundamentally a part of the solution and can only ever be. And so for that principal at that school, he will start to understand that uh, our sense of being Aboriginal is not something that we carry in a backpack and we just leave it at the school gate and pick it up on the way home. Uh, because if I have to do that, if my children have to do that and pretend that there's something that they're not inside school, then that's going to undermine their sense of feeling good about themselves. And, in my very first year of education as an educator, um, and all educators know that if kids don't feel good about who they are, then that's going to diminish their ability to learn and be the best that they can be. One of the other pillars of the um, one of the other pillars of the stronger, smarter approach is um, embracing positive Aboriginal leadership. And if we had more time for a conversation, I could talk to you about. Um, various styles of leadership, indigenous leadership, uh, sort of being the victim type leadership, uh, 
Um, and also a type of booting the victim type leadership that gets very popular. Um, but there's, I describe this sense of uh, beyond the victim type leadership. So I'm going to finish on this. I want to share this picture of a very dear old friend of mine who's some years past now, um, Hooper. And uh, let me just, I want to read this extract from my book, Good Morning, Mr. Sarah. In all good bookstores, I suppose I should. <laughs> I, in the book, I was talking about uh, working back late at the school uh, various nights when I was at Sherbrooke in the first couple of months until the kids told me about ghost stories about the school and when it was <laughs> got dark, I would be out of there straight away. But in those early couple of months, I'd work back late at the school till 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night and these drunks would come stumbling through and they'd want to talk. And that was okay, but the conversation would go around and around. But this guy was one of those guys, and he came in, and uh, he, he was not like the others, and so I was just explaining this. One of those vagabond friends was Hooper Coleman. He was such a rogue with the blackest skin wrapped around a stocky, yet reasonably muscular body. Every scar on his face and body had its own story about fights he had gotten into, police he had run from in his younger days, but most were about some lady he had loved and forsaken. He had a lot of scars. <laughs> Hooper would sometimes stumble in telling me that he'd been drinking metho, and it would be clear from the smell he was talking straight with me. Hooper never bothered me in the same way that others did though, because I was often so intrigued by the things he would tell me about. He grew up on the Sherberg Mission and hated it so much that he ran away when he was 14 to live on the streets in Brisbane. And I talked about various things. Um, all these big noting leaders would come around and pick up us drones at Musgrave Park and fill us full of grog. We love it because it was a free charge and they'd take us to the rallies and put us right up the front while they stayed back because the cops would get to us first and flog the hell out of us. But it was okay, because we didn't feel anything, and we had to make a stand. To many, Hooper might have seemed like just some old drunk, but he was offering me an amazing insight into the challenges of Aboriginal people in the 1960s and 70s. This was different from what I had learned or experienced myself. This was the story of people from the mission. Through Hooper's rich stories, and the stories of others, I realised that the challenges faced by Aboriginal people who had grown up on the missions were quite different from those who hadn't. This is not to say it was easier, harder or more complex than living off the missions. It was just different. And then I talked away about, talked about a couple of other things. Um, Hooper was obviously intelligent and well-read, yet it seemed in a conventional context he had little to show for it. In part, I guess it may have been because he didn't step up into the right places at the right times. Conversely, I'm also certain it was partly because the people he encountered simply didn't have the capacity to embrace the leadership skills he had to offer. Maybe this was because he didn't come in the conventional leadership package. Maybe it was because it was easier to oppress and contain him rather than engage him in some type of authentic dialogue in which all would be challenged and as a result be better. Whatever it was, I was not going to make the same mistake of missing out on what he had to offer. Now this is me talking to him. Hey brother, have you ever thought about coming to work here at the school with me? I've got nearly all females on staff. I need some strong males in the place. And he says back to me, he says, what? You're looking for new groundsmen or something? No, no, I need you in the classroom. These kids have got to see you in action and they need to hear the things that you've got to say. Oh yeah, I reckon I could give that a crack, he replied as I edged closer to cutting a deal with him. As he thought about it, he became even more animated. You know, these kids are really smart, but they just got to be given a chance. They got hard lives, some of them, but they just need someone to kick them along and keep telling them they can do it. It was bad enough all the shit I had to go through when I was a kid and I don't want to see them end up like me. They've got a lot of opportunities now and if they can just get that step up and get that little bit of a kick along, they can really go places. Not like me. That's what I want them to do. 
It was an awesome soliloquy. I watched on in silence, mesmerised. A flicker of light was emerging from the darkness of his life. In this one conversation, Hooper had shifted from being just some old drunk who most people didn't take too seriously, to a man committed to changing the lives of children of Sherberg and ensuring that they were projected into a future that was better than his past. I've always been amazed at the leadership you can see when you give it a place to be. And I'll, I'll finish on that note um, just by leaving you with some things to reflect on. And uh, I won't bother talking about that. And just invite you to just think about those things and uh, challenge you to look beyond a contaminated kind of insight into the mediation of being Aboriginal about some people and connect with the core humanity of Aboriginal people. And if we can do that, um, we'll be all richer for it. When we think of the challenges we face together, it is a kind of, a kind of connection with a contaminated mediation or the stereotype of being Aboriginal um, that would let, an Abori uh, let a policeman cause the death of an Aboriginal man on Palm Island with no consequence. But connecting with the humanity of that, that man would see us all cry out for justice. When we see Aboriginal children living in abusive home lives, the kind of con connecting with a contaminated view of being Aboriginal would see us just leave kids in that circumstance. Whereas if we connect with that child's humanity, we would, we would say, this, we need to make this right and get that child away from harm. And then if we reconnect with a positive sense of that mediation of being Aboriginal, we would know that we don't have to remove the child. We, we would know that we can remove the child from that household, but we don't have to remove that child from that particular family. And these are the sorts of things that we can, these are the sorts of things that we can do. Embracing the humanity of Aboriginal Australians and the positive mediation of our sense of being an Aboriginal will enable white Australia to understand and share all that is superb and exceptional about us. With this sharing, your connection to country significantly deepens from 230 years to 65,000 years. And with a deeper, more respectful and authentic relationship, we truly can transcend the challenges we face together. Thank you.